Painting, Grapevine Canyon, Nevada, number one, is the ground plan of a temple. Two is the symbol for submersion, having gone down with myriads of inhabitants. Three is the symbol for the sun having set forever on the land of land submerged, and includes the sunset and life cross and submersion. The details of this ground plan, one say, this temple is erected to the memory of Mu, the motherland of man, which has been submerged with myriads of souls. The central figure, four, represents a shrine of holy or holy of holies. Within this shrine is M reversed, M, Mu, motherland, showing to whom it is dedicated and that she is no more, she is dead. On either side of the central figure are three Taos, T, the symbol of resurrection. This is a common way of referring to the motherland all over the world. On the moonstones of Anur, Anurajapura, Ceylon, the symbolical animals are in groups of three. On the great monolith of Tiwanaku, Peru, the thrones are in groups of three. In the heads of the figures in Central America are three crowns, and so on, ad infinitum. The three divisions about the shrine represent the three rooms where the devotee receives this three degrees of religious knowledge. This is the usual construction of ancient temples. The three rooms are confirmed by the treble figure five at the entrance. This is the shape of the ends of all the rooms representing heaven and earth. In the room itself the degree is shown by the number of stars within the triangle. At the right of this temple is the glyph. This is a compound symbol and reads land or lands submerged. 2a is a symbol meaning multitudes. Thus the glyph shows multitudes of souls submerged. <coughs> At the left is another compound symbol, 3. A is the sun. B stands, uh, B lands submerged. Translated, it reads, the sun shines no more on those lands which are submerged. Therefore, the whole tableau says, Mer uh, Mu, with myriads of souls, has been submerged. The sun shines no more upon her. She is in darkness. She is dead. The second stone is adjacent to the previous one. It represents a sacrificial scene. 1. The animal on the altar. 2. The fires to consume it. 3. The symbol of submerged Mu. I have, I have included this drawing to corroborate the previous one and furnish additional proof that the temple was dedicated to Mu and that Mu had been submerged. There were no burnt sacrifices previous to the destruction of the motherland. Burnt sacrifices were introduced as a religious ceremony to commemorate Mu and her people being consumed by fire as she sank into the fiery abyss. Gold Gulch, Beatty, Nevada. This rock is one of nature's freaks that was utilized by man many thousands of years ago as a guide to travelers and a commemorative monument to Mu. Roughly, the stone resembles the squat and bent figure of a man in a posture of grief and mourning. He is heavily cloaked in the ancient Manchu style, with arms folded across the knees. On the top is a weather-worn stone, which represents the head of the figure. In place of eyes are pecked and painted two symbols, both very pronounced as to meaning. One reads... Chipezi, which translates means a mouth opened, fires came forth with vapors, the land gave way and went down. 2a. This is the escutcheon of the empire of the sun, the land of Mu, a sun with eight rays. Instead of the center being a symbol reading the empire of, this has in its place 2b. Ahau, the king, the great king, the great ruler. Freely read, the writing on this face says, a mouth opened, volcanic fires and vapors came forth, and land gave way, and Mu, the great ruler, the empire of the sun, sank into that abyss of fire. On the left arm of the figure, the first symbol is three, the, the ha, which translated reads toward water or in the direction of water. From the main symbol are shown streams joining each other. The characters on this picture are all Uyghur Maya. These people may have been Mongols. This is a guidepost, nothing more, telling the way to water. It is a crudely drawn ancient conventional face looking in the direction of water. The first water to be found in this vicinity, by the way, is a spring, pond, or lake, and farther on, a river. The ground is intersected with trails, and the figure shows which road to take to the pond or spring. The first settlers in the United States made their settlements along the southwestern states. 
These settlements were wiped out by cataclysms at the same time that contemporary settlements in Mexico were also destroyed. These were of a very early date, probably during Pliocene times. <coughs> A second civilization, and probably a third, followed them. These were destroyed by cataclysms and by the raising of the great ranges of mountains. The raising of these mountains, by the way, made deserts of many fertile lands in Colorado, Arizona, and Nevada. The cliff dwellers were the last colonizers to arrive from the land of Mu. When the first settlements were made in the southwestern states, it was before the mountains were raised. When the cliff dwellers entered America, the mountains probably had been raised uh, uh, for we find their houses in the cliffs of the mountains. The cliff dwellers spoke uh, the Yucatan Maya language, as is shown by their use of the Maya hieratic alphabet, which I have found in Nevada. One would judge from the points where we find the remains of the cliff dwellers in Colorado that the mouth of the Colorado River was their port of entry into America. It is quite apparent that after reaching their objective point from the motherland, the mouth of the Colorado River, they proceeded to work up the river and inland. From remains of them found in various states, it is shown that they did not confine themselves to the main river, but worked out on all of its branches and smaller tributaries, some even going beyond the water route by trails on land, such as the old Zuni Trail. Generally, however, they seemed to choose water routes in preference to land routes. Working inland from the Colorado River's mouth, they would first pass through Arizona, which state is full of their remains. Their old homes and remains show that they worked out on the Gila, Little Colorado, and Grand Rivers. In New Mexico, their remains are also abundant. After passing through Arizona up the Colorado River, they wound their way up into Utah. Utah is rich in their remains. Branches of the Colorado continue into Nevada and Wyoming, and in both states there are remains of these ancient people. Leaving the main river and working up on the branches, the Grand San Juan, White, and Yampa rivers, the cliff dwellers would naturally enter Colorado, a state which is extremely rich in their uh, remains. Basing calculations on these not only possible but probable routes, the great figures pecked and painted on the rocks, in peculiar positions with extraordinary hands and feet, were unquestionably guideposts, a dumb language guiding and telling the traveler about the journey ahead of him. I know this is true because I have deciphered and translated some of them. All the regions surrounding the Colorado River are literally filled with the works of the old cliff dwellers. These remains consist of cliff houses, rock paintings, rock writings, and various utensils and instruments. The fact that these works are only found in the vicinity of the Colorado River and its tributaries is the strongest sort of evidence that the Colorado River was the gateway through which the cliff dwellers entered America, and possibly their predecessors as well. When the cliff dwellers came to America is problematical. There is no positive evidence, nor in fact anything to give us any intimation. They, or their ancestors, however, were here before the mountains were raised, which would fix their date at 12,500 years ago. Arizona, Dr. Walter Ho of the Smithsonian Institution, came, uh, made an examination of the petrified forests of Arizona and reported that he had found the remains of four distinct peoples there. This find corresponds with my own discoveries in our western and southwestern states, as well as in Mexico. Three of house dis uh, civilizations existed before the mountains were raised. I have also examined a copy of a crude ancient rock picture found in the Hava Supai Canyon, Arizona. It is more than 12,000 years old and shows that man was living in Arizona contemporaneously with the Mastodon. New Mexico. The ancient history of New Mexico is the ancient history of the Pueblo Indians, whose past constitutes one of the most fascinating tales ever told about the ancient men of North America. The Pueblo Indians, when they first came to America, were a very highly civilized and enlightened people. Their traditions and the data found among them prove the fact. They have the oldest records and traditions of any North Americans who came to this continent from the motherland. In our western and southwestern states are many ancient ruined cities and structures, rock pictures, rock writings, pottery, and traditions. 
Our famous scientists and archaeologists have been particularly bashful about telling us anything about the people who occupied this land before the present inhabitants. The most they tell us is that these writings are from 3,000 to 5,000 years old. It is from the Hopi and Zuni Pueblos that the most information is to be obtained. To me, these tribes are the most interesting of all the North American Indians living today. Possibly this is because I know them better than any of the others. Their connection with the motherland is perfectly established, and their traditions also tell us that they originally came to America from Mu. All their religious inspirations are traceable back to the first religion of man, and their sacred symbols are virtually those of Mu. I have a Pueblo ceremonial blanket, the ornamentations of which are sacred symbols derived from the motherland. Their traditions are interesting and far-fetching. A fascinating tradition of theirs is about the creation of the first man and woman, the Adam and Eve of the Bible. It is most valuable for the reason that the language of the motherland is found in the esoteric meanings of some of the words. The Zunis and the Hopis have two special gods who are supposed to shape the destinies of mankind. These gods are held sacred but are not worshipped. In other words, they are comparable to our saints. The names of these two gods are Ahai Inta and Matsailema. Uh, these were the first children of the god of the sun. This sentence bears careful analysis. The Hopi Indians have differentiated between the sun, the collective symbol of God, and God himself. They point out that the first man and the first woman were the children of God himself, and not the children of his symbol, the sun. I have found in ancient writings, especially in those of the Hindus and Egyptians, passages where the sun is called the father of life and the waters the mother of life, but in each instance they are speaking about nature's products and not the special creation called man. They also speak of the sun's forces working on the earth's affinitive forces. The Hopi Indians hold that man and woman were the children of God, the great God who rules the sun, therefore they are not the offspring of nature. A further corroboration lies in the esoteric writings of the names of man and woman. Their names are composed of vocables of the mother tongue, and like all ancient religious writings, uh, have a hidden meaning. <clears throat> For instance, Ahainta is made up of the mother words Ahainta, and Matsailema of Matsailema. Conjoined, they read, God created the first man and the first woman to occupy the earth. These first children of God were the parents of all mankind. The language of the Pueblo Indians contains, as I have pointed out, many words of the mother tongue, and many others find their roots in the same source. Another legend reads as follows. Their forefathers came to America in their ships from across the sea in the direction of the setting sun. Thus it is shown that they came to America from the west in ships not over the much, uh, not over the much abused and imposed on uh, Bering Land Bridge. Uh, when the Pueblos first came to America, they were in a highly civilized state, which is corroborated by their wonderful knowledge of geology, their cultivated language, and their use of the sacred symbols of the motherland. A peculiar coincidence that I discovered among the Pueblo Indians was this. They had seven sacred cities of Cibola. This is a pure uh, copy of the motherland and a custom that prevailed among her colonial empires. For instance, the motherland had seven sacred cities of religion and sciences. Atlantis had the same, and India had her seven rishi, or sacred cities. Lieutenant Cushing lived among the Hopi Indians for a long time while he translated what has been called the Zuni myths which are myths only because the people into whose hands they have passed have failed to understand them. These Pueblo traditions have been handed down orally from father to son for thousands of years, but a tradition is actual history, not a myth. I shall take some extracts from Lieutenant Cushing's translations, which added to my own personal knowledge of the Pueblos, make interesting reading. For example, a Zuni tradition says, Once the earth was covered with water, no land appeared anywhere. Is this a myth? Not at all, for it has been corroborated by the sacred writings of the motherland and by geology. Another Zuni tradition says, Just before man appeared upon the earth, the ground was so soft and watery, man could not have walked upon it. His feet would sink into the ground, therefore he could not live upon it. 
a description of what sort of footwear a man must have had to enable him to pass over the soft, watery ground without sinking into it is very amusing. Although geological works do not mention this kind of ground as having been in the world at any time, yet that such was the case in clearly, uh, is clearly enough shown by the shape and character of the feet of the early tertiary animals that had long, spreading toes like the feet of our present-day wading birds, frequently the muddy shores of rivers, ponds, and lakes. Another so-called Zuni myth, the ancient Zunis, thousands upon thousands of years ago, had a perfect knowledge of the great reptilian monstrosities that frequented the earth from the Carboniferous Age down to the end of the Cretaceous period. The traditions say they were monsters and animals of prey. They were provided with claws and terrible teeth. A mountain lion is but a mole in comparison to them. Then those above said to these animals, Ye shall all be changed into stone, that ye be not evil to men, but that ye be a great good to them. Thus have we changed ye into everlasting stone. Thus was the surface of the earth hardened, and many of all sorts of beasts turned into stone. Thus too it happened that we find them throughout the world. Their forms are sometimes large in shape, like themselves, sometimes they are shriveled and distorted out of shape. And we often see among the rocks many beasts that no longer live, which show us that all was different in the days of the new. I think Cushing hardly caught the exact translations in the words I have italicized. My changes, however, in no way alter the meaning. The foregoing has been passed along as another Zuni myth, yet in, other, in order to prove that it is not a myth, one has only to stroll through any of our museums to see on every side the truth of the Zuni tradition. Go to the Museum of Natural History in New York and look at the fossil of the crested uh, tratrodont, or visit the United States National Museum at Washington and gaze at the complete and perfect skeleton of the Jurassic dinosaur Stegosaurus crushed and flattened. There may be readers who will say that these have nothing to do with the Pueblos and that they do not prove the tradition not to be a myth. For the benefit of such doubters, let us consider the Habasupai Canyon in Arizona. There, drawn and carved on a rock, is a picture of the most terrible carnivorous dinosaur that ever existed on Earth, the gruesome Tyrannosaurus of the late Cretaceous period. This picture probably was drawn more than 12,000 years ago. It is only within the last hundred years that this form of reptile was known to our scientists. Cuvier found a part of a skeleton and out of it made a reproduction, a great lizard walking on all four legs. I think I am correct in saying that it is actually only within the last 50 years that the true form of the Tyrannosaurus became known, although it had been faithfully depicted in rock drawings by ancient man thousands of years ago. The Zunis also have various traditions about the flood. I quote the tradition about this catastrophe as published by G.W. James. In the long, long ago, the Zunis were very wicked, and in spite of the continued warnings of those above, they persisted in their evil doings until the shadow people determined to destroy them from the face of the earth. Accordingly, the two great water sources of the world were opened, the, the reservoir of the above, from which all rains descended, and the wet reservoir of the below, from which all springs creeks and rivers received their flow. The very plugs were withdrawn, and the rain poured down, and the floods rose, until the Zunis knew the wrath of the gods was falling upon them. Hastily they fled to the summit of Tayo al Lane, Thunder Mountain. There the younger ones of the wicked and profane laughed at the fears of the others, and openly scoffed at the idea that even the floods of heaven and of the underworld beneath could ever rise so high as to reach them. But slowly the water arose, higher and higher it came, until even the scoffers were silenced, and dumb dread filled their souls. In vain the priests uh, of the various brotherhoods danced, sang, prayed, and made big smoke, made medicine, 
and offered gifts, the angel of those above, the anger of those above would not be turned away. At last the chief of the priest went away to a quiet part of the mountain summit where he could meditate and pray and more especially intercede for the people. He finally came back and said that those above could have their anger turned away from them only in one way. The choicest of the young men and the fairest and sweetest of the young maidens must be sacrificed and then with appropriate ceremonies be flung in to the waters. Thus could the wrath of the gods be appeased and their anger turned away. Sadly, the people listened and then discussed as to who should be offered as the needful sacrifice. A youth was found as handsome as a young god, athletic, healthful, radiant, fine-feathered, and beloved by all. When people uh, w then, while no one dared to whisper it, the thought went through the minds of all that the only maiden worthy was the beloved and only daughter of their revered Kachike, which he looked up to uh, see whom the people had chosen. There was no maiden there. Tears sprang into his eyes. Calling his sweet daughter to him, he said a few words to which she reverently bowed her head. Taking her stand beside the youth, those present knew that the sacrifice would be complete. Carefully robing them both in their finest ceremonial costumes, placing suitable decorations in their hair, around their arms, and in their hands, the young pair may, uh, were made ready. Then slowly and quietly, but increasing in volume and agony, the death wail was sung, after which the Kachike blessed them both, and invoking the pardon of those above to be gained at so great a cost, he flung them headlong into the seething waters. It was done not a moment too soon, for already the throng were standing on a small piece of high land left on the mesa top, with the waters completely surrounding them. In less than an hour the waters had gained their height and began to subside. Days and weeks passed, however, before the valley was dry, and the chastened people could return to their homes. Not long after this, one of the youths who had been foremost in wickedness happened to look up towards Tai Yo Alane, and there saw two figures standing out clear and plain on the mesa top. Calling to his people, they were soon gazing in wonderment and awe at the sight, knowing that those above had given this to them as a sign. This was confirmed when the Kachike solemnly assured them that these were the heavenly made images of their loved ones given as a sacrifice. The outer, larger one was the youth, and the inner and smaller one was the maiden. As a matter of fact, there were six of these shafts on Thunder Mountain, two large ones and four small ones. James, after thanking his Zuni narrator, pointed out the fact to him whereupon the Zuni replied, Ah, the youth and the maiden cried out to those above that they were lonesome, so the gods married them, and by and by four children came two boys and two girls to make them happy. In the tradition, it will be noted that the word kachike is used to designate the head or principal of the tribe. A kachike is a kiche maya word meaning the principal head. In Peru, the kiches, who originally came there from Central America, are now known as quichuas, and their word for principal or head is kachike. It is the same in Venezuela among the descendants of the Karamayas from Central America. The Zuni tradition of the flood is a particularly valuable piece of geological information because it proves that the waters of the last magnetic cataclysm extended far beyond the geological drift line in America. Various Pueblo traditions, their language, their sacred symbols, and other evidences prove that the Pueblo Indians originally came to America from Mu. As I have already shown, Mu was submerged some 12,000 years ago. Therefore, as these Pueblo Indians came directly from Mu, they must have been in America at least 12,000 years. The Pueblos have many of the Quiche Maya words in their language, in addition to which many of their original conceptions are identical with those of the Quiches, showing that either in the motherland or on their first arrival in America they were geographically in close proximity. The Pueblos have been little influenced, if at all, by the white people of today, and live now as their ancestors did for many centuries, preserving with great care not only the purity of their language, which they teach their children to speak correctly, but also their customs, traditions, and ancient rites and ceremonies. 
Another connection with the Quiche Mayas and the far distant past is their prominent symbol, the bearded serpent, Quetzalcoatl, found principally in the Parjarito Park region. In confirmation of the foregoing, Professor E. L. Hewitt of the Las Vegas University reports that he has found in the homes of an ancient people fossil remains of the mastodon and saber-toothed tiger, also utensils made out of live, not fossil ivory, thus corroborating the Havasupai Canyon picture. Colorado Desert. In the Colorado Desert, there are some famous remains of a great past civilization. These remains have been a puzzle to scientists, but they merely substantiate the old tale of ancient man and his original habitat. The Colorado Desert, like the Oregon and most other deserts, was once fertile and land uh, was once fertile land made waterless by the raising of the mountains. It is conclusively proved, however, that the people who lived where the Colorado Desert now stands lived there before the western mountain ranges were raised. Nebraska. Professor R. W. Gilder of Omaha, Nebraska has made one of the most remarkable and valuable archaeological discoveries ever made in any part of the world. His discovery shows uncontrovertibly that man was living in North America in a highly civilized state back in the tertiary area. Era. Gilder was discovered a, has discovered a civilization that was wiped out by the waters of the last magnetic cataclysm, which was the biblical flood and the geological glacial period. Gilder reports that the familiar buffalo wallows of the West were never made by buffaloes. They are instead the entrances to ruins of underground dwellings in which thousands of years ago lived a race which has vanished from the earth. There is no indication of who the people were or how they were wiped out. Among the ruins of these long-filled burrows, Gilder has found various works of art of the vanished race. Number one is a glazed clay pipe. Number two is a fish hook made of bone. Number three is a clay face with prominently sloping eyes. Number four is a small pink soapstone head. Gilder says of it, the pink head is Egyptian in every feature. It is delicately carved and highly polished. It is Egyptian in headdress, having even the rectangular ear guards worn by the Egyptians. It is more than Egyptian. It resembles the face of Ramses II himself, if the marble busts in Oriental museums today are images of the Egyptian king. Number five is an ornament made of shell. Number six is a comb made of elk horn. Uh, the floors of these underground burrows are strewn with charred sticks, reeds, coarse grasses, and corn cobs. In the floor of every cave is found a catch which, uh, where most of the domestic utensils and other valuables were kept hidden. Sometimes there are several in the same cave. The mouths of the catch are always found plugged with layers of burnt clay. On top of this is a layer of ashes. Beneath all, the cavity wind it widens in a jug or bottle, often the size of a hogshead. These artificial caves were filled in with the soil and drift torn up by the waves of the cataclysm as they rolled down over the plains. In time, this filling packed and left a hollow at the entrance, which has been called a buffalo wallow. Gilder civilization was wiped out by the last magnetic cataclysm, therefore it was a tertiary era civilization. Kentucky. In Kentucky are the remains of a civilization that was uh, contemporaneous with Gilder's Nebraska civilization. At Blue Lick Springs several years ago, an excavation was being made. Twelve feet below the surface of the ground, the workmen came across the bones of a mastodon. Farther down, they found a stratum of gravel, and underneath the gravel, a stone pavement. The stones forming this pavement had been quarried. Their upper surfaces had been cut and dressed, while their lower sides were in the rough. The mastodon in this excavation belonged to the Pleistocene period, as it lay above the gravel. The gravel was formed by the waters of the last magnetic cataclysm, and the stone pavement uh, being below the gravel shows that this civilization, like Gilder's, was a tertiary era civilization. 
George W. Rank, the Kentucky historian, in his History of Lexington wrote, The city now known as Lexington, Kentucky, is built of the dust of a dead metropolis of a lost race, of whose name and language and history not a vestige is left. Even the bare fact of the existence of such a city and such a people on the site of the present Lexington would never have been known but for the rapidly decaying remnants of ruins found by early pioneers and adventurers to the Elkhorn lands. But that these remains of a great city and a mighty people did exist, there can be not the shadow of a doubt. Who then were these mysterious beings? From whence did they come? What were the forms of their religion and government? These are questions that will probably never be solved by mortal man, but that uh, they lived and flourished centuries before the Indian, who can doubt? Here they erected their cyclopean temples and cities with no vision of the red men who would come after them and chase the deer and the buffalo over their leveled and grass-covered walls. Here they lived and labored and died before Columbus had planted uh, the standard of old Spain upon the shores of a new world, while Gaul and Britain and Germany were occupied by roving tribes of barbarians, and it may be long before imperial Rome had reached the height of her glory and splendor. But they had no literature, and when they died they were utterly forgotten. They may have been a great people, but it is all the same to those who came if they were or not, for their greatness was never recorded. They trusted in the mighty works of their hands, and now indeed are they a dead nation and a lost race. True, the mighty works of their hands, so far as buildings are concerned, are one with Nineveh and Tyr, but their hands left other records upon the imperishable rocks, and it is by these records we may identify them as colonizers from Mu, the motherland. Therefore, by the foregoing facts that I have recorded about discoveries in North America, we have positive proofs that the whole of Western North America was peopled by highly civilized races during the latter part of the tertiary area, era and before the geological glacial period. Hundreds of rock writings, confirmed by many legends, also tell us that these first civilizations of North America came from a country called Mu, and that Mu lay to the west of America, beyond the horizon of the Great Water. This is positive because the Nebraskan and Kentucky civilizations have now been shown to have existed during the Pliocene period. Oregon, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico show us civilizations that existed before the mountains were raised. As these civilizations antedate the mountains, they also went back into the tertiary period. How far back into the tertiary area era they went is not known, as no date has so far come to light to tell us. It remains an open question. Those ancient dwellers in our western states known as cliff dwellers were represented by several distinct tribes, and it is possible that instead of being merely tribes, they were distinct nationalities. I surmise this from their rock writings and rock paintings, which show that different tongues were spoken. The writings are also in varying forms of symbols and alphabets. A close examination discloses that some of the rock writings and pictures that have been assigned to the cliff dwellers of North America are thousands of years older than others which appear within a stone's throw of them. These very ancient writings and pictures were executed before the mountains were raised, which is proved by the fact that some of the rocks on which they are written are fractured and displaced. In some places the fracture divided the writing, and in others characters are found that have been split in two, one part appearing on one side of the fracture and the remainder on the other. <clears throat> this indicates that the rock was fractured and displaced as the ground was being ele elevated. Other writings is clearly revealed that they were written after the land was elevated. It is impossible to give here a detailed account of the rock writings and rock pictures of North America. I have been compelled to confine myself to a few that cover two important points. First, those that give an approximate date of the civilization. Second, those that tell us the origin of the people, where they came from, and how they came to America. It is quite doubtful if all the those classed as cliff dwellers actually belonged with that people. That is, certain writings assigned to the cliff dwellers were probably written by people who were not cliff dwellers at all. 
That the cliff dwellers came from Mu is certain, for every one of their pictures that are used as guideposts contains a reference to Mu. In fact, the rock writings and pictures of the cliff dwellers, except those drawn from artistic effect, are permeated with references to Mu, both before and after her submersion. In addition to this, they invariably use the symbols that were in vogue in the motherland. Among the rock carvings I have found four different branches of the Maya language that were in use. Also the evidence that these ancient Americans used three differently arranged alphabets. Chapter 11 Niven's Mexican Buried Cities the next step on leaving the United States will be to pass into Mexico. One of the, re the most remarkable and without doubt most valuable geological and archaeological discoveries made has been achieved by William Niven, mineralogist of Mexico, who recorded it some years ago, but like all other American discoveries, it was apparently not considered in the slightest way by the scientific world. Niven's discovery has a twofold significance, for in addition to enlightening the world about prehistoric man and dating his civilization far back into the tertiary era, thousands of years before the majestic mountain ranges raised their imposing peaks above the plains, it gives a clue to when the great gas belts were formed and mountains were raised. It shows that highly civilized races struggled through the most appalling and terrific volcanic workings the earth has ever known. It shows that man was in existence and in a highly civilized state tens of thousands of years before the geological glacial period and the European Pleistocene ape man. It also adds links to a chain of evidence showing that the earth civilization can be divided into two parts or periods, before and after. Before and after what? The future will disclose. Niven's discovery being so valuable geologically and archaeologically, I cannot do better than to give his own wording about those ruins. Over an area of about 200 square miles in the Valley of Mexico, from Texcoco to Jaluipantla, Hal there are hundreds, yes thousands, of clay pits. After serving the city of Mexico as sources for building material for more than 300 years, these pits have enabled me to make an extensive examination of a vast ruin. Recently my efforts have been rewarded with some remarkable and startling discoveries which seem to open up a new field for archaeological research on this continent. My operations have been confined to an area some 20 miles long by 10 miles wide in the northwestern portion of the Great Valley. There I have found traces of two civilizations and three well-preserved concrete floors or pavements, each one at some time underlying a large city. These, pavement, these pavements are at depths of from 6 to 25 feet from the surface. Above the first there is a deposit of small boulders, pebbles, and sand covered with a foot-thick coating of the rich soil of the valley. The great age of this upper or younger floor must be plain, when every layman stops to consider the number of years required to deposit one foot of earth on a level plain. Everywhere in this deposit of boulders, pebbles, and sand above the first floor, I found fragments of broken pottery, small clay figures, diorite heads, spear and arrow heads, spindle foils, and other artifacts mostly broken. The second concrete floor is from four to six feet below the first. The difference in distance between the two being accounted for by the broken condition of the lower pavement due probably to seismic disturbances. In the intervening space between the two pavements, one and two, I have failed to find a single piece of pottery or any other trace to indicate that people had once lived there. Underneath the second pavement, however, came the great find of my many years' work in Mexican archaeology. First I came upon a well-defined layer of ashes from two to three feet in thickness, and since proved by analysis to be of volcanic origin. Just below the ashes I found traces of innumerable buildings, large but with regular in size, and appearing uniformly in more than 100 clay pits, which I have examined during my recent investigations. All of these houses are badly ruined, crushed, and filled with ashes and debris. In the past week's work I found a wooden floor, the wood of which had petrified and turned to stone. 
The door was arched with a semicircular uh, lintel made by bending the trunk of a tree about five inches in diameter or thickness. This is the first curved arch ever found in the ruins of Mexico, and as the walls of the house were made of stone, bound together with a white cement harder than the stone itself. This wooden arch must have been put in as an ornament. Cutting through the door, I came into a room about 30 feet square, filled with almost pure volcanic ash, apparently about the only room strong enough to withstand the terrible weight of soil, ashes, and stone above it. The roof, which had been of concrete and stone and flat, had caved in, but around the lower edges of the room great flat fragments of this roof had formed arches, little caves in the ashes, in which were preserved many of the artifacts of the dead race shown in the accompanying illustrations. With the artifacts were bones, numberless bones of human beings, which crumbled to the touch like slaked lime. Above their tomb the waters of a great flood had raged, wiping out another civilization. Flood and crashing boulders had not disturbed the sleep of this mighty race. The doorway was over six feet deep, and on the floor thirteen feet from the door I came upon a complete goldsmith's outfit. I consist, it consisted of a terracotta chimney twenty-five inches in height, tapering upwards from a round surface fifteen inches in diameter. On the floor around the furnace, to which still adhered bits of pure gold, I found more than two hundred models, which had once been baked clay, but which had been transformed into stone. All of these were duplications carved on figures and idols which I found later in the same house. Evidently this had been the house of a prosperous goldsmith and jeweler of the better class in this ruined city. Some of the models or patterns were less than one twentieth of an inch in thickness, and were used for the manufacture of the gold, silver, and copper dress, head, breast, arm, and ankle ornaments which the statuettes showed to uh, the people to have worn in those days. Each model was thickly coated with iron oxide, bright and yellow, probably put on there to prevent the molten metals adhering to the patterns while in the casting pot. Later on, a thin gold plate made for the breast and ornaments with characters unlike any found in a Palenque or Mitla rewarded my search, and I have since found several of these results of the labors of the goldsmith. The work is fine, beautifully polished, and shows a height of civilization fully as great, if not greater, than that possessed by the Aztecs when the Spaniards under Hernando Cortes first invaded Mexico. But what stuck me most as the remarkable feature of the room was the mural decorations. Evidently there had once been a slight partition through the center, while from the rear walls the dim outline of the door appeared to lead into another room, which is now so complete a ruin that I doubt that anything other than bones will be found in it. In the front part of the present room, however, the goldsmith evidently had his workshop, while in the back was the entrance to his residence. Here are wall paintings done in red, blue, yellow, green, and black, which compare favorably with the best photographs I have ever seen of Greek, Etruscan, or Egyptian works of the same kind. The ground color of the wall was a pale blue, while six inches down from the fourteen-foot ceiling a frieze containing in dark red and black ran all around the four sides. This frieze, owing to the fact that it had been glazed after painting with a sort of native wax, is perfectly preserved so far as colors and patterns go. It has been, however, broken in three places by fragments of the falling roof, but otherwise it is almost as legible as the day when first painted. It it depicts the life of some person, evidently a shepherd, bringing him from babyhood to his deathbed. Beneath the room I found the tomb of someone of importance, possibly of him whose life was portrayed in the frieze above. In this vault, which was only three feet in depth and lined with cement, were seventy-five pieces of bone, all that remained of a complete skeleton. One large fragment of the skull contained the blade of a hammered copper axe, which had evidently dealt uh, death to the occupant of the tomb, and which had not been removed by his relatives or friends. The bones crumbled to the touch, so long had they been in the tomb, but there were other objects more interesting than the bones. One hundred and twenty-five small clay terracotta idols, mannequins, images, and dishes of all kinds were rang were ranged around the bottom of the tomb. 
The most wonderful and striking of these is the terracotta figure shown on this page, figure three. It has the form of a man in a sitting posture. His legs are crossed Japanese fashion and the hands on the knees. The type is strongly Phoenician or Semitic, while the head is hollow and movable, and can be moved from the image at will, being set on the neck by means of a cleverly devised truncated tenon, which fits into a mortise at the base of the skull. One must remember that the examination of this room is but a step on the edge of the mystery of this great ruin, 200 square miles in area, and reveals nothing of the history of this wonderful people who have been completely lost to the knowledge of mankind. Less than three miles from this locality, which I have just described, I found an ancient riverbed now dry, in the sands and gravel of which were thousands of terracotta and clay figures, having faces representing all of the races of southern Asia. The pottery and figures found at a depth, the lowest eighteen feet below the surface, are the best, and it is reasonable to suppose that a people of such culture and of such manifold numbers had imposing temples and governmental edifices comparable to those of Mitla, Palenque, and Chichen Itza. If so, when they are uncovered by future generations of archaeologists, the ashes which overlie this vast city will have preserved every ruin as perfectly as they did Pompeii and Herculaneum. To my mind, there will be found data that will prove the Aztecs the least important of the races which have peopled Mexico, and quite probably the latest to enter Mexican boundaries in that wonderful emigration that peopled North America in forgotten ages. Subsequent to the publication of the foregoing, Niven wrote further on the subject of the buried cities, following are notes from this second publication. The, uh, the Chinaman. This image proves with indispute, uh, indisputable evidence that the people who lived ages ago in the Valley of Mexico knew and were familiar with the Mongolians. The ruin in which I found the Chinese image was in the remains of the third or lowest civilization 30 feet down from the surface in the pit which I had dug at San Miguel Amantla near Haluepantla, 19 miles from the National Palace in Mexico City. The first upper civilization, marked by a cement floor and walls of a concrete building, I found at a depth of 8 feet. 11 feet below, this was the second middle civilization of about the same grade of development as the first, and 30 feet 3 inches from the surface of the ground I came on a bedchamber or tomb, I do not know which, in the third stratum of ruins which contain the finest artifacts I have ever seen in Mexico. I am inclined to think the room was 30 feet square, its walls were made of concrete and crushed down to within a foot of their bases. Below was a tomb. In the center, on a raised rectangular platform, also of concrete, lay the skull and some of the bones of a man who could not have been more than five feet in height. His arms were very long, reaching almost to the knees, and his skull was decidedly of a Mongolian type. Around his neck had been a string of green jade beads. Green jade is not a Mexican mineral. Lying beside the body was a string of 597 pieces of shell. I say string, but the buckskin thong which had once borne them was long since rotted to dust, and the wampum, or money, lay as if it had fallen from a string. With this money lay the greatest find of all, the uh, Chinaman. It is the first of its kind ever found in Mexico, though uh, Mongolian types exist in different numbers among the Indians of all Mexico to convince any one that the Indian blood of the country originally came from Asia. His oblique eye slits, uh, padded coat, flowing trousers, and slippers make him uh, a present-day Chinese in all respects except for the Q which is lacking. The Chinese did not, however, adopt the Q until they had been conquered by the Tartar hordes from the north. The little statuette is about seven inches high, and where the arms are broken off, the clay of which the image is made shows red and uh, friable in the center. Outside, however, the clay has metamorphosed into stone so that it can be chipped with the hammer only with 
with the greatest difficulty. It is about three and a half inches in width across the chest and one and a half inches in thickness through the abdomen. In the ears are huge rings similar to those worn by the Chinese today. On the head is a skull cap with a tiny button in the center, almost exactly like the caps of the mandarins of the empire, which has now become a republic. The coat, which is loose and of a type still worn by the Chinese, is shown fastened with a frog and a button, while on the breast is a circular plate or ornament, evidently covered with a layer of beaten gold, but worn bare by contact with the earth of unknown ages. Each arm is broken off at the shoulder, and the open of the entire tomb has failed to disclose the missing hands. This Chinese image was not made by Aztecs. It had been buried in the earth in the Valley of Mexico for thousands of years before the Aztecs set foot on the plateau. The Aztecs were newcomers in Mexican history, the bloodthirsty conquerors of the great civilized and organized races of Mexico, who ravaged with fire and sword the cities built by the Toltecs, Olmecs, and Mayas. The Aztecs did not build, they took buildings from the builders by force of arms. Um, the 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 little Chinese uh, furnishes exactly the length for which we have been searching. He says without speaking that the most ancient tribes of Mexico were offshoots of the Mongols. Near the skeleton but off the platform lay a flower vase about 15 inches high, undoubtedly filled with uh, Hochitil, the yellow sacred flower of particularly all of the ancient races of this country. I shall now review Niven's report of his discovery of the remains of three prehistoric civilizations, where one is buried underneath the other. Geologically, it is shown that the discovery is the discovery of the most ancient civilizations, of the most ancient works of man yet found. The youngest or upper civilization dates far back into the Pliocene period, tertiary era. The character of the buildings and other evidence reveal that the oldest of the three civilizations was a highly developed people. Geologically, it reveals that it has flourished uh, tens of thousands of years before the European Pleistocene degenerates lived. Niven notes that he found iron oxide in use in casting ornaments out of precious metals. This is the oldest record of the use of iron ever come upon and antedates the Bronze Age by tens of thousands of years. Niven says that the characters on the gold and silver ornaments are different from those of either Mitla or Palenque. Laplongen has called attention in his works to the fact that the characters found at Palenque, Mitla, and Copan are different from and totally unlike the Maya. Niven found that the life of the man who was buried in the vault below was depicted on the walls in the chamber above the frescoes and paintings. When Prince Ko of the Khan dynasty of Mayaks was buried 16,000 years ago, his life was depicted in frescoes on the walls of his mausoleum. Thousands of years later, we see the same custom followed in the burial chambers of the Egyptian kings. Niven mentions that the copper axe he found in the skull of the man was highly tempered, so that his now lost art take, uh, dates back far into the tertiary era. In the second vault opened, Niven found an immense number of articles which had been placed around the corpse, mannequins, statuettes, etc. I found this a custom among all the ancients, and it is still practiced by some peoples. Niven appears astonished that he found images of all the ancient Asiatic races. It would have been more astounding if he had not, because the people of southern Asia and the people who built these now buried cities both came from the same motherland. Niven, gives, uh, Niven notes that he found green jade beads and that green jade was not a Mexican mineral. Lepalongin uh, discovered in the tomb of Queen Mu of Mayax a green jade ornament which he called Queen Mu's talisman. I have examined this ornament and can safely say it is not New Zealand jade, so that the green jade found in Mexico must have come either there from China or from the motherland. Niven, like the rest of the scientists, has fallen back for want of a more plausible explanation on the old threadbare theory that the first men to come to America came from Asia. His statement that the most ancient tribes of Mexico were offshoots of the Mongols needs qualification. Along the shores of the Caribbean Sea, the original settlers appear to have been mixed with Mongols predominating. 
through Yucatan and the inland parts of Central America, a white race predominated. They were called Mayas, and the white races of Europe, Asia, Minor, and Northern Africa are easily traced from them. North of the peninsula of Yucatan, every record in detail points to the fact that the great bulk of the original settlers were Mongols, and possibly, in these northern regions, all were Mongols. Eventually, however, the northern hordes of Mongols overran and conquered the whole of Mexico and Central America. They put the men to the sword and made slaves of the women, so that now, as Niven says, Mongol blood is traceable in all of the Mexican Indians. Niven notes that yellow flowers were found in the second tomb and states that this was a custom among all the ancient races of Mexico. Yellow has ever been the sacred color. It was so among the most ancient peoples and is today among certain peoples. When prehistoric cities are found buried one underneath the other, archaeologists use the terms first, second, and third civilization to designate the order in which they are found. This is apt to be misleading to the layman, for he might assume that the first is last and the last is the oldest. They are numbered from the surface down, thus the first one found, the one nearest to the surface of the earth, is the youngest civilization, and the one deepest down is the oldest civilization. Again, the word civilization is out of place, for the layman might assume that there have been several civilizations, whereas there have been only two since man first appeared on earth. These two will hereafter be designated, the first and the present great civilizations. The better word to have used would be colonization or settlement, such as the first, second, and third settlement of the land. Generally speaking, buried cities are prehistoric. The prehistoric cities belong to the first great civilization. Niven's buried Mexican cities and Schliemann's ancient Troys are examples of prehistoric cities, while Pompeii and Herculaneum are the exceptions. Although Pompeii and Herculaneum are buried, their histories are known, therefore they are not prehistoric. Again, while many cities of the first civilization lie buried beneath the ground, there are remains of others which lie above the ground, but heaps of ruins, Baalbek in Asia Minor and the old Maya ruins in Yucatan are such examples, also the old ruins on the Polynesian and other South Sea Islands. Niven's prehistoric cities all belong to the first civilization and lie close to Mexico City, which was built during the present civilization. During the first civilization, Niven's prehistoric city was thrice built. I wish this carefully noted because hereafter I shall quote records stating that another prehistoric city only a few miles away was also thrice built. These records state why and how the destruction of this last city occurred. One geologically shows us the the cause. The other states uh, it in records, but both agree in every detail. The altitude of the present city of Mexico is 7,400 feet above sea level. Therefore, the present altitude of Niven's cities is the same. As a geological problem, an extraordinary field has been opened up by Niven's finds. One has only to look at the following facts to see that a great part of our geological teachings must be rewritten. 1. A prehistoric city lies 7,400 feet above sea level. 2. The city lies 30 feet below the surface of the ground. 3. A layer of volcanic ash covers the city. 4. The city is on a plain surrounded by mountains. 5. The mountains are many miles distant. 6. Above the remains of this city are the remains of another. 7. Over both cities are deposits of boulders, gravel, and sand. 8. Above these cities are the remains of a third. 9. Also covered with boulders, gravels, and sand. At the present time, the remains of Niven's cities are 74 feet above sea level. Niven reports that the lowest city is covered with volcanic ash, but does not record the presence of lava in any form, so it is presumable that the lava from the volcano did not reach the lowest city. That the volcano or volcanoes were near is self-evident from the fact that their ashes fell in sufficient quantities to bury the city. This being the case, it shows that then, as now, the land was a plain around, um, around about. Being a plain, this volcano, like all ancient volcanoes, piled up around the craters and formed cones, similar to those seen in South Africa and among the South Sea Islands today. Again, there is the possibility that very little lava was ejected. This was the case with many of the ancient volcanoes. 